The right-tailed z-test, testing the mean of a normal distribution when the standard deviation is known. A researcher wishes to test whether the mean of a normally distributed population with variance known to be 98 is greater than 82. Based upon a random sample of seven observations, she observes a sample mean of 91. Assuming the significance level is 5%, a. Determine the z-score and perform the test. B. Determine the p-value and perform the test. C. Determine the smallest value her sample mean can be, but still give a statistically significant result. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, let x be a normally distributed random variable with unknown mean and variance equal to, and it says that the variance is known to be 98. Now, in most stats classes, it's easier to think in terms of standard deviation than it is variance. So let's get the standard deviation first by taking the square root of the variance. And we're going to have to round this off. And let's round it off to the nearest 10,000th. So we have some precision in our uh, calculation. So the square root of 98 9.899, this four gets rounded up to a five. And the reason why I'm rounding it to the nearest 10,000th is because I wanna make sure that you know, my answer has a reasonable amount of precision. Okay, so part A says determine the z-score and perform the hypothesis test. All right, so let's first start, let's first start by writing out the actual hypotheses. And let's do this very carefully because in case we were to mess this up, if we write out our hypotheses carefully, even if we made a little mistake, we might get partial credit. So the null hypothesis is that the population mean is equal to, and she says, here it says, test whether the mean of a normally distributed population um, is greater than 82. So 82 is the hypothesized value. And so the alternative hypothesis is that the population mean is greater than 82. Okay. So the next thing we're going to, and we should always state the significance level of the test very close to the hypotheses. Do that so that your professor knows, you know that the significance level alpha and the hypotheses are related to one another. That's a really good thing. And so part A says determine the z-score and perform the test. So we know that z is equal to x bar minus mu naught over sigma sub x bar. And remember that mu naught is called the hypothesized mean. And sigma sub x bar is called the standard error of the mean. Now, it's no um, coincidence that there's a little subscript zero for the null hypothesis, and there's a little subscript zero for the hypothesized mean. This is the formula for a really good reason. So we have the fact that the sample mean uh, was observed to be 91. So this is 91 minus, 
Now the hypothesized mean is 82. And don't forget the formula for the standard error of the mean is equal to the standard deviation of an individual observation divided by the square root of the sample size. So let's say you're having some difficulty with the math and you want to pick up some partial credit. Just write under this little, write this little formula down and write SEM for standard error of the mean. And I'm sure your instructor will know that that's what it is. So we already know that the standard deviation is about 9.8995. divided by the square root of the sample size. So here it says, based uh, seven observations right here, based upon a random sample of seven observations. So this is over the square root of seven. So now what we have to do is we have to put this into the calculator pretty carefully. So I'm gonna hit the parenthesis button first, and then I'm going to go 91 minus 82, and then I'm going to close the parentheses, and then divided by, now I'm going to put parentheses again for this whole denominator, 9.8995 divided by the square root of 7, and then I'm going to close my parentheses to show the calculator or, or program the calculator, that we have a numerator, that's its own numerator in parentheses, and we have a denominator, that's its own denominator in parentheses. And then we hit the equals button, and we get 2.405. I'm gonna round this up to 2.41. Now, the reason why I rounded this to the nearest hundredth is because eventually I'm going to be looking this up in a little table, and the table uh, gives z scores to the nearest hundredth. So that's why I rounded to the nearest hundredth. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to draw a little picture here. And this is our null distribution, which is a z distribution. And we have 2.41 over here. And this is our observed z-score. So if you want to get partial credit, even if you mess up a little bit um, with the math, write z subscript OBS for z observed under the observed value of your z-score. So this shows your um, instructor, even if you messed up the math, you know that it's an observed z-score. And you're going to be comparing that to what's called a right-tailed critical value. So I'm gonna call it crit for short. Now, what what is the right-tailed critical value? Well, since this is a right-tailed test, we are going to have 5% of the area to the right of this critical value. That's the same thing as the 95th percentile. So this critical value is the 95th percentile. And this could also be called Z sub 0 0.05. This is, this is another piece of notation that is very useful. So some tables are going to give you percentiles. Other tables are going to give you Z sub alpha values. That all depends kind of on where your instructor is in terms of like tables and things like that. But I'm gonna to go to the back of this book and this happens to have a nice little table for Z sub alpha values. So if you look here, I just made it a little bigger by drawing it in. 
this is the z sub alpha value, alpha area to the right. And if we have, now keep in mind, 5% is the same thing as 0 0.05, right? So if we have 5% of the area to the right, our critical value becomes 1.645. So let's put that in. 1.645. Now, you need to know the rule, and what I would suggest doing is, even if you mess up the math, write all this stuff out so you can get partial credit. So the decision rule is if your z-score is greater than or equal to your z sub alpha score, then reject the null hypothesis. So sometimes what people do, if they really want to show their greater, <laughs> that they know what they're doing is they'll write the z-score, which is 2.41, And the critical value is 1.645. So anybody who's grading this is going, even if you messed up, you know, the math, you did something wrong on the calculator, anyone who's grading this is going to see, okay, the student wrote the decision rule. If your z-score is greater than or equal to your critical value, then we reject the null hypothesis. And we see it is. So what I would do to get full credit is I would write something like since our z-score, and I'd write z sub OBS, the observed z-score, is greater than or equal to the critical value. And I'll just write crit, C-R-I-T. Since the z-score is greater than or equal to the critical value, the appropriate decision is to reject, and I just write R-E-J for reject, the null hypothesis. And that is perfectly fine if your instructor wants the answer just in pure statistical lingo. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Although your instructor may want you to use the term significant in the answer. So another way to write this would be since the z-score observed is greater than or equal to the critical value, her Sample mean is significantly and that's the real word here greater than and the hypothesized mean was 82. And this is probably, and you, you probably might want to state at the 5% significance level, just to, you know, make sure you cover all the bases. So that is probably a better way to write it. This way of writing it shows you really kind of understand how this would be applied in the real world. Since the z-score observed is greater than or equal to the critical value, her sample mean is significantly greater than 82 at the 5% significance level. And that's part A. So I'll put a little check because we're done with part A.